Hi everyone and welcome to Tech Cravers. I often get questions about how to do this or that and which emulator to use for certain games. So in this video I want to start from the very beginning. I'll walk you through every step on how to set up and get started with a new Android handheld. Let's dive into how to get everything ready for gaming on a fresh device. I won't be going through how to tweak every aspect of an emulator, but rather the essentials to get you going with emulation of your old retro favorites as fast as possible on your new device. The plan is, first I'll show you the initial setup process including what apps and emulators I recommend, and then we'll go through how to configure the settings to optimize your gaming experience. By the end of this video you'll have a clear understanding of how to get your Android handle ready for hours of fun. And in this specific guide I'll I'll be using a micro SD card where I have all my games stored. These game dumps are called ROMs and it's important to note that downloading ROMs from the internet is illegal, even if you own the original game. My recommendation is always to create your own ROMs using the available methods. For instance, I have a guide among my other videos where I explain how you can do it yourself. And on the same micro SD card I also have the necessary BIOS files for certain systems. Don't worry, I'll guide you through when, where and how you need these BIOS files. I suspect this video will be a bit longer than normal, so go grab something to drink and let's get started. Ok, so before we dive in and talk about how to set up each emulator, I want to quickly list which emulator I prefer for each system. There are some systems I'm simply not interested in playing on my handles, so I usually skip those. If you notice that I've left out an emulator or system in this guide, feel free to leave a comment down below and we'll help you out there instead. However, the process is usually quite similar and straightforward no matter which emulator you're setting up. And remember, these are my favorites and the ones I think generally runs the best. Sometimes I switch between a few different ones, but in this guide we're focusing on keeping things as simple as possible. Let's start with the trickiest part. For many of my older games like Game Boy, Game Boy Color, Game Boy Advance, NES, SNES, Sega Genesis, PlayStation and Sega Dreamcast, I use an all-in-one solution called RetroArch. RetroArch works like a hub where you can download emulator cores to play your old favorites. It's simply the most convenient solution for quickly getting started with retro gaming. It also offers many handy features like save and load states, fast forwarding and more. Personally, I'm not very interested in arcade games, old LucasArts points and click adventures or even older systems like Commodore, Amiga or DOS. However, if I were, I would also use RetroArch for these systems. I'll cover the essentials shortly, but for now, let's continue listing the emulators I use. And the next system is Nintendo 64, and for that I use an emulator called Muppen 64 Plus FZ, which is available for free on the Google Play Store. However, I bought the Pro version, which is a one-time cost. This version offers additional features and can be downloaded on my future devices as well. It also removes any ads that you can see on the free version. For Nintendo DS, if I'm lazy I just download the Melon DS core for RetroArch, but when I want to be able to tweak some more I use the standalone emulator Drastic, which is available from the Google Play Store. Drastic used to be a paid app, but after Nintendo's lawsuit against Juzu, the developer made the emulator completely free. For PSP I use PPSSPP, which is available from the Google Play Store. It's free, but there's also a gold version that costs money. The only difference is that the icon turns gold instead of blue. It's a great way to support a developer if you want to. I play my 3DS games using the Citra emulator. Citra used to be available on the Google Play Store, but it was removed after Nintendo's lawsuit against Juzu. So Citra needs to be sideloaded onto your Android device, but more on that soon. There's also a fork of Citra called Lime 3DS where development has continued, but I haven't really bothered to look it up yet since Citra can still be used. For GameCube and Wii I use the Dolphin emulator. There are many variants and forks of Dolphin which works differently depending on whether you have a new high-end device or an older one. We've been spoiled recently with relatively affordable handles that can handle GameCube and Wii pretty well making me a bit picky. As a result I almost exclusively play GameCube and Wii on more powerful devices. I primarily use the Google Play Store version of Dolphin as it's the most accurate of the emulators and offers excellent performance. However, it typically requires a slightly more powerful device than average. PS2 emulation is a bit different now compared to before. It used to be enough to download the Aether SX2 emulator from the Google Play Store, but unfortunately that's no longer possible for reasons we can discuss another time. Now the community modification Nether SX2 is the way to go, and I'll show you later how to install it, but in short it involves using a program to patch the latest version of Aether SX2. 
And with all that being said, we've come down to the last system I usually like to emulate and that's Nintendo Switch. But unfortunately Nintendo Switch emulation is still a bit of a hot topic, especially after Nintendo's lawsuit against Yuzu. So I'll be skipping Switch emulation in this guide, however I can mention that there are three emulators with various features and performance that I typically use to play my Switch dumps on Android and that is Skyline, Yuzu and Sudachi. And now that we finally have gone through the emulators I use, it's time to install them. We'll start with RetroArch which is undoubtedly the most comprehensive and could easily have its own guide. If you have a question regarding any specific feature in RetroArch that you think I'm leaving out in this video, leave a comment down below and I or some of my wonderful subscribers will do our best to help you out. Because in this video I'll cover the most essential features and how I typically set it up. This is also where I usually pause and leave my new Android device for the first time to configure the SD card I'm about to use on my computer. If you mount the SD card in your computer that you have already used in your Android device, there will be a bunch of folders on it that Android creates. But don't mind them, they can be there. Now I create a folder where I can store my BIOS files and other things that I might need on my device later, such as special emulators I want to download on my computer and then sideload onto my device. Most importantly, I also create a folder for all my games, aka ROM files. Inside my ROMs folder I'd like to have a separate folder for each system I'm about to emulate, so it's easy to navigate later. Now all the folders I have here weren't created by me, but by the Emulation Station installer. I have covered how to install Emulation Station in another video, which I recommend that you watch after this guide to perfect your emulation experience. Anyway, once you have your SD card filled to the brim with games and BIOS files, you can put it back in your device and we'll continue to install the emulators. So for RetroArch, instead of downloading it from the Play Store, use the browser on your device and head to RetroArch.com. From here, click on the Download tab and scroll down until you reach the nightly and the stable version of RetroArch. Download the nightly build and install it on your device. You might need to allow your browser to install apps in order for it to work. Once RetroArch have been installed, launch it to continue the setup process. And the first time you launch RetroArch, you need to allow it to access your external and internal storage, so click OK and allow to continue. Then the first thing I like to do is to change the appearance of the RetroArch menu so that it gets a more modern user-friendly interface. So click on the right D-pad until you reach the settings tab. Click on user interface and then scroll all the way down to the bottom. And under menu, change GLUI into XMB to make your menu look more like a PlayStation 3. Now keep this in mind, in order to execute any setting in RetroArch, as soon as you change a setting, you need to go back to the main menu, choose configuration file and then hit save configuration. Once you do, the next time you launch RetroArch, your setting will be updated. Maybe not the most user friendly way, but it's simply something we have to accept. So once more, just to make sure it sticks, whenever you make any changes to your RetroArch settings, be sure to press save configuration for the changes to take effect. Now the controllers on your device will be mapped automatically, so there's no need to do anything about that. However, if you want to change any settings, you can find them under the input settings. Instead, the first thing we want to do is to tell RetroArch where we have all our BIOS files and game files. To do this, go to the settings tab, which looks like two cogwheels, then scroll down to directory. At the top, select System BIOS and locate the folder on your micro SD card where you stored your BIOS files earlier on your computer. The micro SD card on your device might have a strange name and won't have the name you gave it. For example, when I formatted my SD card, I named it Android, but in RetroArch, it's named A18975AF. The emulated storage is your internal storage, so if you have your BIOS files there, go inside and locate them. Once you're in the correct folder, click on Use this directory. Now scroll down a bit until you reach the File Browser section. Here you tell RetroArch where to look for your games. So just like you did with the BIOS files, locate your ROMs folder and select Use this directory. And once you have done that, remember what I told you about saving. So go back and save your configuration file before you proceed. But now it's time to update RetroArch and then download all the cores we need to play our retro games. Scroll down and go into the online updater. Here I usually scroll down and update everything that can be updated, one by one from core info files to GLSL shaders. 
Once everything is updated, it's time to download the emulator cores we need for the systems we want to emulate via RetroArch. This is really up to each individual as different cores offer different features and performance. In this guide, I'll download the ones I usually use. So for Game Boy and Game Boy Color games, I use the Gambet core. For Game Boy Advance games, I prefer the MGBA core. When it comes to NES and Famicom games, I use QuickNES. For SNES and Super Famicom, I rely on SNES 9X. For Sega Genesis or Mega Drive, Genesis Plus GX is my go-to, and for PlayStation 1 games, I use the Swan Station core. Finally, for Dreamcast games, I use Flycost. Once you have those cores downloaded, you're basically ready to start gaming, but before you go, I want to show you how to set up hotkeys so you can save and low states faster, use fast forwarding in games and more. So once again, go into settings, then scroll down to input, and here you want to scroll down again to hotkeys. The first thing you want to do here is to set your hotkey enable button. What this means is that you choose which button you need to press in combination with another button to perform an action. I recommend choosing your select button. This means that pressing select plus another button that you choose will perform the function. For example, I like to set it up so that select plus right trigger saves states and select plus left trigger loads states. There are a bunch of different settings here, so set up the ones that seem interesting to you. Then, as always, save your configuration before it's time to test your games. The last thing we need to do now is to scan our game's library and it's actually very simple. If you go right a few times you'll get to the scan directory tab. You can do this in two ways, either have RetroArch scan the whole ROM's root folder on your SD card or you can scan one system folder at a time. Scanning the entire rooms folder will include PS2, GameCube, Switch and all other folders, making the process more demanding and time consuming than necessary. So I usually recommend scanning one system folder at a time. Start with your Game Boy and Game Boy Color folder, then move on to your Game Boy Advance folder, and so on. This approach will make the process more stable and faster. Your scan systems will appear as separate tabs in the menu bar, and you can easily access your games directly from RetroArch's menu, complete with box art and everything. Now it's time to jump in and start playing. Don't forget to test the different hotkeys you set up. If you need to change a setting or hotkey combination, simply exit the game, open RetroArch again and make the adjustment. You can also set up a button to access RetroArch's menu directly from within the game you're playing, so you don't have to exit the game every time. However, this part of the guide has already become longer and more detailed than I had planned, so let's move on to Nintendo 64. And if you remember from before, the emulator I use for N64 is the standalone pro version of Muppin64+, Plus, which you can download straight from the Google Play Store. You can find the free version there too if you don't mind some ads here and there. So simply click on install and let your device install it and then launch the app. And the first time you launch it, you need to answer a prompt, then simply click on the plus icon in the corner to tell the emulator where to look for your games, just like we did with RetroArch. But don't worry, this will be done in the Android interface, making it a much faster and more user-friendly experience. And you can actually memorize these next few steps because all of the emulators from now on require that you locate your games the same way. Click the three lines in the left corner, which will show you your device's internal storage as well as your SD card. Mine is named Android if you remember. Then navigate to the folder that contains the games for the system you're setting up. Once you get there, click on use this folder, and then on allow. This will make the emulator automatically detect the games in the folder and make them available to play. Some emulators, like Muffin64 here, will automatically set up box art, controls and other settings for you, while other emulators may require a few more tweaks before you can start playing. But if you want to change the pre-configured settings in Muppin64, you can do so by pressing the three lines in the corner. Maybe you want to change the resolution, adjust the controller layout or tweak any other setting. However, I mostly leave it as it is since I want my N64 emulation to be as true to the original as possible. A neat feature that's automatically enabled on Muppin64 is whenever you decide to exit a game, the emulator automatically creates a save state from the exact moment you leave the game. When you want to continue gaming, you can choose to start from that exact state or start the game from scratch, just as if it were on a real console. Ok, time to move on to Nintendo DS. The emulator I use is called Drastic, and you can download and install it directly from the Google Play Store. Launch it, and since it's the first time, you'll need to allow a few prompts. Then click on load new game. Now find the folder for your Nintendo DS games just like you did with the Nintendo 64 earlier. 
Your games will be listed and once you start a game, the controller will be automatically mapped and you will have the standard screen layout with the screens side by side. You will have some annoying touch overlay controls that you can easily remove by tapping the drastic menu button at the bottom middle. Tap the controller icon with a cross over it to disable the overlay. From the same menu you can also change more advanced settings such as resolution or screen layout. However, you can quickly change the screen layout by pressing down on your left and right thumbsticks. But if you want to make more in-depth and precise changes, you can do that from the drastics menu. Once you have set up the screens to your liking and maybe increased the resolution a few steps, the Nintendo DS becomes a really great console to emulate, offering you many enjoyable hours ahead. And as a final note, I would highly recommend choosing an Android handheld with a touchscreen if the Nintendo DS is your main system, for obvious reasons. The next system is the PSP, and the emulator we use is called PPSSPP, which can also be downloaded directly from the Google Play Store. When you launch PPSSPP for the first time, you will be asked to create a folder on your SD card for the PSP data. This ensures that your data will be saved even if you uninstall PPSSPP. Choose whether you want that or not, and when you have done that and get to the menu, click on Browse. And you guessed it, once again we need to tell our emulator where to find our games. Go ahead and locate your PSP games. It's a good thing we only have to do this once for each emulator. And before I start playing my PSP games, depending on the device I use, I usually bump up the resolution a bit. This Odin 2 can handle PSP games at 1080p without any issue, so that's what I'm doing here. And once that's complete, I go into the Controls tab and untick the on-screen touch controls. Since this Odin 2 has a built-in controller, the controller mapping will be done automatically. However, if you're playing with an external controller, you will need to map your buttons under the Control Mapping option at the top. PSP is also amazing to emulate and PPSSPP might actually be my favorite emulator in terms of accuracy and performance. If you click your handheld's back button you can access the PPSSPP menu which allows for save and load states as well as other settings. Alright, on to 3DS emulation. As I mentioned before, this emulator was freely available from the Google Play Store, but it has been removed. It's still available from various sites however, so you need to get it and sideload it onto your device. Once it has been installed and you launch it, you need to grant permission for the emulator to use your camera, microphone and send notifications, and then you need to select a user data folder just like we did for PPSSPP. Lastly, in the setup you need to choose a directory for your 3DS dumps, just like we have done on all the other emulators lately. And once that is complete, we need to map our controller. Simply press the three dots in the left corner, then tap on Settings and go down to Gamepad. Click on each button and map it to any button you want. I usually emulate my 3D games on devices that are quite powerful because I know it's a demanding system. However, this Odin 2 is more than enough spec-wise, so after I have mapped my controls, I go back and head into graphics. Here I usually bump up the resolution 2 or 3 times its native value, or in other words 720p. 3DS emulation with Citra works basically like Nintendo DS emulation with Drastic in terms of settings. So click the back button to bring up your Citra menu and turn off the overlay controls. You can also play around with the screen layouts here or map them to buttons on your handle, just like we did with the Drastic emulator. It's actually very straightforward, so I think you'll manage on your own. But if you have any questions, just drop a comment down below. Okay, and now it's actually starting to feel like downhill, since we've reached the second to last emulator in this guide. It's the Dolphin emulator, which we use to play our GameCube and Nintendo Wii dumps with. As I mentioned earlier, Dolphin comes in a variety of versions, but I usually use the official version available on the Google Play Store. So download and install it just like we did with the previous emulators. You'll notice that you have the GameCube and the Wii logo at the top, and since GameCube is selected by default, that's what we will map the directory to first. So click on the big blue button down in the corner and choose your GameCube game folder. And once the screen populates with your GameCube game's beautiful artwork, tap on the Wii logo at the top and click the blue button again and this time find your Wii games folder instead. Once your emulator has found all your games, you need to map the controllers, both the GameCube controller for your GameCube games and the Wii motion controller for your Wii games. That is quite a mess and I will show you in just a sec, but let's just go ahead and map the controllers for GameCube first. Click the cogwheel settings icon and then tap GameCube input. Next, click on the cogwheel next to GameCube controller 1 and then simply map all the buttons to the corresponding button on your device. 
Once you're happy with your controller mapping, back out of the menu until you reach the box art page. You will see a notification in the bottom indicating that your settings have been saved. Once again, since I know what the Odin 2 can handle, I go back into the settings and then into the graphics option. Then I scroll down to enhancements and internal resolution and bump it up a notch or two. This will make my GameCube games look way better than they did back in the days. The Wii is actually a total nightmare to map controls for, not only because you need to map physical buttons to what motions used to do on the original hardware, but also because different games use different controller layouts. For example, Super Mario Galaxy uses the nunchuck, while Donkey Kong Country Returns is better played with the Wiimote on the side and no nunchuck. All this mess has made Wii emulation a rare activity for me and I usually stick to playing Super Mario Galaxy and Super Mario Galaxy 2. The rest of the Wii's catalogue of games I either play where they are available on other systems or more often than not don't play at all. Skyward Sword is a good example where even the remake for Nintendo Switch is tricky to play due to how Nintendo designed the control scheme back in the days. Now, going through how to map all possible Wii layouts in this video would easily make it another 20 minutes long just for that, so I'm going to have to make a separate video for that if you want to. However, I'm not gonna leave you hanging. I do have a few videos in my video archive where I go through how to map Wii controls for older versions of Dolphin on older Android hardware, like the Odin Pro. You can watch those or you can watch DNA Mobile Gaming's setup video specifically for the Odin 2, which is very in-depth if you want that. Both methods will definitely get you started with Wii emulation, so I will link to both videos in the video description below. Alright folks, the last emulator for this emulation on Android Guide is for PlayStation 2. As I mentioned, we used to be able to download the PS2 emulator Aether SX2 straight from the Play Store, but now we need to use an existing APK or Android app of Aether SX2 and then patch it with the Nether SX2 builder. The process is quite simple though, all you need to do is to download the Nether SX2 builder from their GitHub to your PC, then double click and run the bat file and it will download the APK and patch it for you. After that you can transfer the patched APK to your Android device and install it just like we did with RetroArch for example. And when you have installed Nether SX2 on your device, the first time you launch it you will have to go through a quick setup process. First you need to map your BIOS directory and then your games library, just like we have done with all other emulators up to this point. PlayStation 2 is a system that needs a high-end device to function well, but once again the almighty Odin 2 can run it with ease. So I want to upscale the graphics by clicking the three lines in the left corner and then selecting app settings. There are a ton of options here, but all I want to do is click on graphics and then upscale multiplier and select a higher resolution. I'm going with 3 times native resolution or 1080p on my Odin 2. If you want to, you can also scroll down a bit and enable widescreen patches to make games that have support for it be able to be played in 16x9 aspect ratio. From the game list, click the three lines again and this time click on controller settings. Click on controller port 1 and then on automatic mapping. Select your controller in the list and let the emulator map all the buttons for you. Start up any game and you'll notice that you have a touch controller overlay again. Click the back button on your device to bring up the emulator menu. Tap the D-pad icon which is the controller settings tab and this time click on the touchscreen tab. Click on add remove buttons and start to untick every box there to make all the touch control overlays disappear. And this can only be done while in a game so that's why we didn't do it before. And just like that you're now up and running with PS2 emulation on your Android device. Apart from controller and graphical settings, from the same emulator menu that you reach with the back button on your device you can also save and load states. And by the way, can we talk about how ridiculously good 20 year old Gran Turismo 4 looks when it's upscaled in 1080p. It's truly impressive to see how well the game has aged and how great it looks with a modern resolution. Now, chances are that you're not too keen on jumping around between different emulators with various graphical UIs and ways of displaying your games. Instead, you probably want a unified, sleek place for all your games regardless of the platform. Am I right? 
Well, that my friend is exactly where Emulation Station enters the stage. Emulation Station gathers all your emulators and games under one cohesive graphical profile giving you a much more console-like experience. You can even set up your Android device to boot straight into Emulation Station should you want that. One of the best things about Emulation Station is that once you have set it up on an SD card with your games and configured Emulation Station on it, you can move it between different Android devices without needing to download the box art and other assets again. I have a full guide on how to set up Emulation Station, so I highly recommend checking that out after this video. I'll be sure to link it in the video description. And that concludes my guide on how to set up and run emulators to play all your favorite games from NES and Game Boy to later systems like 3DS, Wii and PlayStation 2 on your Android device. I really hope that this guide will help as many people as possible and that you enjoyed watching it. If you did, please feel free to leave a thumbs up. Comment down below if you thought something was good or if there was something you felt was missing. Thank you so much for spending these 25 minutes with me. I'll catch you in the next one. Happy gaming everyone.